Hello, I'm Rabbi Mark Gelman. Welcome to our Muslim neighbors. Tommy's out chopping wood for the poor, and he'll be with us on other shows. And I just wanted to welcome all of you. Uh, you know, for those of you who have been watching <coughs> our Muslim neighbors, you know that most of our shows have a particular topic. We'll talk about the Hajj, uh, or we'll talk about uh, Sharia law, or we'll talk about uh, the, the attitude toward women in Islam, some specific topic. But something's missing with that, and that is for, for you to share a conversation with our friends. We have some very close friends in the Muslim community who've advised us and helped us, and, and as we move forward in this world uh, with all of the misunderstandings and hatreds that we want to reduce and that we want to eliminate, it really is friendship that will do it. It's not just good ideas, but good friends. So today we wanted to have a conversation with two of our dearest friends, the Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf, a great Sufi scholar, a great Muslim, and a great friend. God bless you. Thank you, Rabbi. And an author of What's Right with Islam, one of the best introductions that you can read uh, to the present state of Islam in our world. And congratulations for the success of the book. Thank you very much. It's good to have you with us. And of course, the, uh, our backbone, our, uh, <laughs> our friend, our, our inspir inspiration for this entire program, uh, Dr. Farooq Khan of the Islamic Center of Long Island. Farooq, welcome. Thank you. So um, I'm just so glad you're here because quite often in our shows with a single topic, things just fall through. And, and what we want to do is just have a show of conversation in which we talk about some of the pressing questions of the day and, and what your thoughts are. We, we sent our crew out to the streets to talk to some uh, non-Muslim Americans about what questions they might have, uh, what questions they might want to ask uh, as they learn and read about Islam. So let's take a look at our people on the street and uh, let's try and answer some of their questions. My question for our Muslim neighbors is why can't women drive in Saudi Arabia? Okay, the treatment of women and the status of women. <clears throat> there are 56 countries in the world which have a Muslim majority population. There's only one country in the world where Muslim women are not allowed to drive. That is Saudi Arabia. So it clearly has nothing to do with the religion. Right. If it was religiously mandated, then 56 all... 56 countries, right. So it's basically a lo local, tribal, cultural phenomena, and I really don't have any explanation for it. It doesn't make sense to me. The issues of custom has, has become very much the dominant uh, 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 factor in many Islamic countries. So there is things that just are customs, but not Islamic law. Well, here's the... Th well. Th Islamic law is not just Quranic law right. or the law of the prophet. There's a lot more to, Islam, to what's called the law is, or Sharia law is whatever right. Muslims uh, regarded as their law. And the custom and traditions in different areas, if it did not directly contradict a particular ordinance or, in, or, or a prohibition in the Quran or of the prophet, it was deemed to be constitutional, if you will, or Sharia compliant. In that sense, it's Islamic. So while women in Saudi Arabia may not drive, for example, you have, you have had five women heads of state of Islamic countries, Turkey, Pakistan, Bangladesh today, and Indonesia. Women are ministers. The vice president of Iran mm -hmm. is a woman. You'll find ministers, you'll find uh, professors, they drive, they are very much part of society. All right, next question. My question for our Muslim neighbors is, was Islam spread by the sword? First of all, Islam was very rarely indeed spread by the sword. Uh, right after the death of the Prophet, the, the Muslims did indeed have an empire. But In the 8th century? Uh, even from the early, late 7th century, they began mm -hmm. to expand and, yes. uh, and conquered Egypt and Palestine, Byzantium and Iran. But many are unaware that, that until... It took five, six centuries for Egypt to have a, um, a, uh, a majority Muslim population. From the very beginning, in fact, the, uh, the, the Arab Muslims did not enforce uh, people and did not even encourage a conversion uh, towards Islam. It was only later that as people uh, themselves opted to become Muslims. And until the, uh, the end of the Ottoman Caliphate in 1924, uh, Muslims have always, well, Muslim rule has always engendered a multicultural, multi-faith tradition. In the Ottoman Caliphate until then, in, in Egypt, until the mid-1900s, uh, you had 
Greeks. You had, uh, in fact, m most of the many areas of modern-day Turkey had majority Greek populations. Uh, you had Greeks, you had Armenians, you had Kurds, you had uh, Arabs. Right. The, you had the golden age of Judaism exactly. is the 12th century in Spain in under Spain, Muslim rule. Where we had, where we had Jews, Muslims, and uh, Christians thriving together, exchanging and learning from each other. Mark, this question comes up all the time, and I want to use two examples. I was born and brought up in Kashmir, which is a predominantly Muslim community. Sure. And no one ever came there and brought it by sword. It was through the actions of the folks who had come from Muslim places, through the Sufis, that the whole community converted. Indonesia at this time is the largest Muslim country in the world. And no army has set ever, foot, conquered, it, ever right. conquered it. It's through the experience of the traders that the mass convergence occurred. In the United States, we have mass convergence going on right now. And there's no force. It's basically people get the message, they understand it, and they relate to it. I, I'm surprised people don't ask, why was, is it true that Judaism was spread by the sword? Because we had an empire. It was only 300 years. But we, <laughs> yeah. we, we had an empire from 700 to 1,000 before... Uh, from 1,000 to 700 before the Common Era, and it was uh, gone. So all of us have had an experience of empire, and all of us have had an experience of spreading religions through the word and not through the sword. Next question. My question for our Muslim neighbors is, what is the Islamic view on euthanasia and suicide? Okay, that's, easy. that's yours. That's easy. No, no. No, no. <laughs> Same with Judaism. Totally not permitted. Life is precious. You preserve life at all costs. However, now, many times I get this question about euthanasia from people who have a lot of pain and they want to be... Uh, pain control is permitted. Sure. And as long as your intentions are to relieve the pain and not to perform euthanasia, it's okay. Uh, and intention is the key to all the actions. So the answer is very simple. It's not permitted. And although in all of our traditions, correct me if I'm wrong, doctor, uh, we are allowed to remove an impediment to death. Yes. In other words, if your brain is dead and you're, on, you're, you're intubated or you're, you're on a machine that's making you breathe through a, through a, a machine, that you can remove that and Pull, let someone die. Pulling the plug in a brain-dead person is totally permissible. Right, because they're already dead. Yes. Absolutely. So people should understand that. The quest for life, the protection of life, is virtually the same in every one of the Abrahamic faiths. It's one of our most precious shared possessions. Um, so, our next question. My question is, how are religious minorities treated in Muslim countries? The traditional Islamic theological and legal or jurisprudential opinion is that uh, minorities, religious minorities, have their rights and their rights have to be protected. What has happened, unfortunately, with the end of the Ottoman Caliphate and the the paradigms that that Muslim world has gone under over the last century has shifted from a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious view of the good society to what I call the idea of religious nationalisms and authoritarianism. This has become very dominant in many of the many countries of the Muslim world today, with the result that not only do minorities have had their rights denied. But even the Muslims themselves have had their human rights in many cases violated. By other Muslims? Yes, by, by their leaders who may have been secular, like the... Uh, in ba the Ba'athists. Like the Ba'athists. Like, like the, the, we can have fascism right. under, within an Islamic veneer, like what happened the, the, with, in Afghanistan under the Taliban. But let's go to the actual question of, minority, of the Dhimmi. D-H-I-M-M-I? Dhimmi, yes. Dhimmi, right. of the, which is the category of a non-Muslim resident yes. in, a, in a Muslim community. Uh -huh. We have the category of Ger Toshav, which is a non-Jewish resident in a Jewish community. But what is the... So, so the, the law is that they must be protected. The, the, they yeah. cannot be disadvantaged. But is there, do, can they be identified by certain special clothing or other limitations on their freedoms in accordance with... This is, this is not a requirement of the law. There was a custom in, in, in ancient times, until actually maybe a century ago, that people would always identify themselves right. by their religion, by their profession. If they were a particular profession, they would, they would wear a particular kind of hat or a particular kind of robe, for example, in much of the Muslim world, religious scholars would wear a certain kind of hat with a, uh, um, a wrapping around it. Uh, a farmer would wear a certain kind of clothing. Even in Europe, there was, there was distinctions of identification. And, and part of the problem is that we're trying to, uh, to judge or gauge ancient customs 
by, by, mod, by the standards of modern custom, which is not really a fair thing. The, 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 the big issue which people had always was security, personal security. How would you assess and, the and treatment the, of minorities at the moment in Muslim countries? It leaves much to be desired. Hmm. Of course, in some countries it's, it's, it's excellent, like in Malaysia, for example, yes. and where, where, uh, where uh, they have uh, uh, figured out a way to, to share not only political power, but also, more importantly, economic participation and well-being and yes. prosperity. Okay, well, we have to take a break. Uh, we'll be right back in a moment with more questions and answers with our friends on our Muslim neighbors. Stay with us. questions that are on the minds of the American people today. So let's go back out to our interviews on the street and see what the pressing questions are. Next question, please. Hi, my question for our Muslim neighbors is, how come non-Muslims are not allowed in the holy cities of Mecca and Medina? The strict legal theological prohibition is just in the area of Mecca and its surroundings. At the Kaaba or the whole city? Well, it, it's, it's called the Miqat, the, the, which is a, uh, a general radius of maybe, I don't know, 10, 20 miles from the, from the Kaaba itself. The, there was no prohibition against any part of the, any, anywhere else. The prohibition against non-Muslims entering Medina only happened after the second caliph, Omar al-Khattab, was assassinated by a non-Muslim in Medina. Oh, so it was for a safety reason. It was a, for a security reason. And so that tradition sort of just continued. And that tradition just yeah, well, became, it became somehow duplicated in the area of Medina. Um, however... Uh, um, but what's the thinking in Mecca? It, it's just a statement that, that, uh, that, that unbelievers in particular, uh, the, the sanctity of the place is to, is to uh, adore God. And the purpose of Mecca, Me Mecca was actually established by Abraham, according to our narratives, yes. by Abraham when he deposited his uh, son um, Ishmael and, uh, and his mother Hagar mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in that desolate uh, spot. Right. So it was, it was a space dedicated for the worship of God, and uh, therefore the presence of non-Muslims with other kinds of activity would somehow mar the, the purity of this act of worship. Mm -hmm. It's purely from that kind of a... Uh, uh, a rationale. Very interesting. Next question. Hi, my question for our Muslim neighbors is, is it true that anti-American rage is widespread throughout the Muslim world? Okay, let's, let's take that up. The, the anger against America from Muslim countries. How do you assess this? Well, there are just uh, an article in, uh, I think, the day before yesterday in, uh, in the Washington Post indicated that uh, there has been a growing anti-American sentiment across the whole world, not only in the Muslim world. It certainly exists in the Muslim world. And that, that has to do with the way our policies have been articulated uh, to, to the rest of the world. Uh, if we articulate our, our positions well, it will, make a, it will make all the difference in the world. What, what we need to do is we need to, what, what our administration needs to point out is that the war on terror is not a war against Islam, yes. but that it is a war for Islam, for the Islam of the Prophet, for the Islam of his companions, for the Islam of an enlightened Islam, a pluralistic Islam, not the Islam which many people have mis misunderstood and promulgated today. I agree. Rabbi, I just wanted to reinforce that the anger and the resentment felt throughout the world is about the policies. It's not about the American citizens. Right. Uh, con this country is still held in great esteem. You go to any part of the world, you'll know about Coca-Cola. But you will not know about this kind of a conversation going on in a Catholic I know. channel with a rabbi, with a and, rabbi and two Muslims. This, the, the goodness of America is not, pretty much not known to the rest of the world. The goodness of anything is not known through the news, and that's because, as we learned when we went on TV, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> and if that, it doesn't, it, it disappears. It disappears. <laughs> so the only, if there's a car wreck or a catastrophe or, or some terrible murder, that goes on. So you have to understand that, uh, that, that people love what they love, and they, they're confused about certain things. And after all, it's obvious that <clears throat> many of the 
Arab leaders have used Israel as a scapegoat to have their people hate Israel rather than try and reform their own countries. And there are legitimate questions about American policy in addition to that. So it is, it's, a, it's a complicated question. Um, when I look back at, at, at Jewish history, the Jewish-Muslim relations have been the most positive of all. And so really what we have to understand is that everyone who is a person of goodwill wants peace in this world. And the idea that there's irrational hatred to America is simply not true. I think that there are great changes that have occurred and great changes that are yet to be. I think I wanted to pick up on something you made. Uh, one of the contributions we as a community in North America can make is help the folks in the Middle East move towards a just resolution of that ongoing conflict. Absolutely. Because that has a disproportionate impact throughout the world, that unresolved Palestinian-Israeli issue. Yes. And if we can help those folks come to the table and get the issue settled, we'll all be better off. I completely agree. May it happen speedily and in our time, and may it be God's will. Amen. Next question. Hi, my question for our Muslim neighbors is, how does Islam view terrorism, and does the Quran condone it? Let me take a shot at that. Okay. The suicide bombings come up all the time. Uh, a professor at the University of Chicago did a study for 21 years of suicide bombings and came to a conclusion that 40% of the 188 suicide bombings he studied occurred in a country which most people don't have a clue about, which is Sri Lanka, which is a dispute between the Buddhists and the Hindus. That the Tamils? The Tamils and the Sinhalese. Right. And the bottom line was that in an, it's an asymmetrical, in an asymmetrical conflict where one side has all the weapons and the other side has nothing, this has been found to be a very effective tool to get back at the oppressors. And the, what he concluded was that it's pretty effective, it gets the message across, and we're going to see more and more of it, as we are seeing in Iraq now. And uh, it is not religiously mandated. It is not approved by any faith to go out and blow up a bunch of people who haven't, uh, you know, harmed you. So religiously, it's not allowed. Killing innocent people is prohibited uh, in all faiths. Yes. And Islam is pretty clear about it, that you cannot take an innocent life. Do you believe that Muslim scholars in the world have made the, the case against Osama bin Laden clear enough? Have there been fatwas against terrorism and fatwas against prohibitions, religious prohibitions against Osama bin Laden from Muslim scholars Absolutely. that have been widely publicized and, or publicized enough, in your opinion? Uh, well, as I pointed out in, the, in my book, right after 9-11, before the United States began to uh, wage its hostilities against Afghanistan, the, the chaplain, the Muslim chaplain of the U.S. Armed Forces sought a fatwa to, to, to answer the following question. Is it okay for U.S. soldiers who are Muslims to engage in hostilities against fellow Muslims in Afghanistan. This question was referred to five of the top, the most well-known jurists in the Muslim world, and they came up with a fatwa saying it is okay for Muslim soldiers in the U.S. Army to engage in hostilities. Now, I was called by, the, uh, by, the, uh, by Laurie, Laurie Goodstein of the New York Times. Yes, the religion reporter. The religion reporter at the time, and I begged her to please give this article, front page article, at the time they had a special section called the Nation Challenge section. Mm -hmm. You had stories about many other things. This would be very important. Definitely. This fatwa. It was better than page B8. Oh, God. That's, that's, that's the challenge that we have. So it was advertised, it was made, but there was a decision not to amplify. This is where the media has a, an, a, an important role to play, which is why we're very happy doing this with you, Rabbi Gelman. Well, and why we're happy to do it as well. This misunderstanding is, is, is actually fatal to our hopes. Precisely. And this is why the, the, the civic responsibility of the media in amplifying those things, at least giving them a level playing field, if nothing else. It's been a very informative session, but it's not over yet. We'll be right back with more when we return on Our Muslim Neighbors. The children ask us on the God Squad. It's actually our favorite shows. Today our guests are entertaining questions from people of all ages regarding the Muslim faith. 
Let's continue now with some more of our people on the street questions about Islam. My question for our Muslim neighbors is, do you think the problem in Islam lies in the lack of a reformation like that in Christianity? That particular question uh, actually occurred in Islamic history. If you examine Islamic history again until the end of the Ottoman Caliphate, until the early 20th century, there was a separation between what you might call mosque and state, effectively. The Sultan was viewed as the authoritative power, and you had the Mufti, and you had the, 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 the ju ju judiciary. Yeah, you mean under the British Empire when the Muslims didn't have power, or where no, in... B tradition, throughout, throughout most of Islamic history, there has been a, a de facto separation between mosque and state, although not between religion and politics. I mean, to, to, as, a, as a for instance... In England, you don't have separation between church and state. No, the, the Church of England is the religion of England, and and the Queen appoints the Archbishop of Canterbury. Yeah. And issues of issues of doctrine have to be approved by the British Parliament. Mm -hmm. But England developed, Britain developed a, a a separation between religion and politics, whereas in countries like India, for example, where you you have a separation of let's say temple and state. Re, uh, politics is very much imbued with issues of religion. Right. So this, this distinction is an important one. Even though there may have been a separation between the caliph, the secular ruler, and the, the various religious authorities, they were separated and they were both Muslims. The question that I think is behind this question is, is Islam prepared theologically, emotionally, to live in a separation in which the caliph is not the caliph, but the president of the United States? I, th I think the answer there is that, you know, when you're living as a minority, you follow the law of the land. Right. That's, that's a guideline which has been laid down very clearly. So I have no conflict living in America as an American Muslim under the rules and regulations of the U.S. Constitution, as long as it doesn't violate my religion, course, my life, course, and, you know, guarantees my protection. Well, so the basic thing that people need to hear then and understand is there's no conflict within Islam of living in a country that is ruled by a non-Muslim leader. The American Muslims have no conflict in living in America as Americans, practicing their faith, abiding by the laws and rules of this United States. Absolutely. And neither do we seek to establish an Islamic state in, this, <laughs> in America, if that's what some people are I, I know, Yes, feel. it is what some people are saying, and it's foolish. Well, that's exactly what happened to the Catholic Church in this country. The, bash, the bishops in the first half of the, ninth, of the 20th century had to, uh, the Council of Bishops had to actually express that the Catholic Church, the Catholics in America, have no desire to, uh, to establish a, a unification of Catholic Church and state in America, I which know. was a fear at that time. Absolutely. Look, John Kennedy had to address that directly in 1960. Exactly. As late as 1960, it was an issue. And people forget that uh, there, were, there were state religions in America into the 19th century. Uh, a state would have a, its own state religion. Yes. So this separation that we think has always existed in America hasn't, and the unity between Islam and the state that we think always exists hasn't. Right. So we need to have a more balanced view about all this. I think really that's, uh, that's the, the main idea. I, I want to close with, with what, you, what are your main hopes for the future. My main hope for the future is to see an Islam that is um, vibrant, that uh, is uh, loving to its fellow uh, faith traditions. I, I love to see a Muslim community in America that succeeds in mediating between America and harmonizing the relationship between America and the Muslim world. I'd like to see a, uh, an American Muslim community that helps uh, develop the, uh, the, the uh, democratic systems and regimes and separations of power and economic well-being that most people in the Muslim world long for. And I look for a greater spirituality and the, and the revitalization of our fundamental Abrahamic ethic to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our minds, our soul, and strength, and to love our fellow human being, which means people like Dr. Farouk Khan here and people like you, Rabbi Mark Gelman, and the Monsignor Tom Hartman, as we love ourselves. Inshallah. May it be God's will. I can't possibly improve on that. No, none of us can. But my hope is that we develop an American Muslim identity, which will be a model for the rest of the community across the globe as a place where we can work together, as we have done in the past, like in Spain, and uh, basically help in the betterment of our common citizens throughout the world. Inshallah. 
And what I hope is that we have enough courage and love to look as we climb the same mountain to the other paths, at the other climbers who are making this world better, more gentle, and more open to God's will. I'm Rabbi Mark Gelman of the God Squad. God bless you.